Howdy, ninth grade families. This is Jeff Rehm. I'm your school counselor here at North Hall High School this year. Uh, and I'm going to be taking you through this back to school, welcome to high school workshop here. And we're going to cover a lot of different things today. Uh, but one of the main goals that I have for us with our time together is to understand a little bit more about your high school student, what some of the stuff that they're going to be working on is, how we can help them along the way, some tips and tricks of how to do that, and then uh, some details about you know, what teenagers are kind of going through as they start to transition into this more adult-like approach to life um, as they go through each grade of high school, eventually leaving um, our walls and out into the, the quote-unquote real world. Um, so this is our game plan for today. So we are going to be spending a little bit of time um, talking uh, about kind of introductory type stuff to myself, to the programming, going over some nuts and bolts uh, about high school, about counseling, about being a parent and a student and a family at North Tell High School. I'm going to take about five or so minutes. I'm hoping to keep it in five minutes. Um, and I want to highlight some information about uh, neurobiology. All right. So neurobiology is a really cool, fascinating thing. And there's a lot going on with teenagers uh, in this time of high school and their brain and their brain development. I also want to talk a little about academics. So highlighting some similarities and differences between things like our graduation requirements and, for example, some of the what we would call A through G requirements, which are the requirements to apply to most uh, four-year colleges around the country. Uh, we're going to touch a little on some support systems uh, that we offer here at the school and in our community and how to access some of those, those resources. And then a couple next steps, like what are some things that we need to be aware of? So um, before we kind of dive in to some, some nuts and bolts about kind of like how do we navigate stuff? I want to talk about um, the lineup of who is here to help your high school student and your family going through high school um, get ready and pre really perform their best while they're here. So there are a number of people, and I, I'm, I'm a big soccer fan. Um, I really enjoy watching the British Premier League, uh, watching my son play soccer. I have three boys. Uh, this year they're eight, four, and two. Um, and it's just a, it's, it's an exciting sport for me uh, to, to, to learn and watch. And so I really enjoy that. And when I designed this presentation, I kind of use it from that lens of getting into the game, this idea of, you know, we are starting to play, right? We've gone through practice and we're starting to get into the actual game per se. So we need to understand, though, who who's on the lineup. And so the coaches are these folks that you see on the screen. And there's more than this, but this is just a couple examples. Um, and this is mainly our office and kind of like outside of the teaching um, profession. So outside of the classroom uh, support system. So we have the admin. Okay. So the North Hall High School admin, uh, you, if you haven't met them yet, you will. Um, our principal is Joanna Mitchell and our assistant principal is Jason Fleesock. So you'll be hearing from them frequently. Um, Myself, this ninth grade school counselor. So I have the even graduating year classes. Um, and then my counterpart, Jennifer Jingo Cohen, and she has the odd graduating classes. And so um, we'll actually be following grade level classes through uh, their graduation year. And so you probably won't be interacting too much with Miss Jingo Cohen, but you probably need to know her name because you might get notices or emails from her uh, or vice versa. They might, you know, her caseload might get stuff from me as well. Um, but just know that we're both here serving in the same capacity. Uh, we also partner with our wellness team. So the wellness center, um, kind of in the upper part of our school, uh, we have a wellness center specialist and then we have a mental health specialist that um, is Hillary and then Jamie is our, our wellness center. Um, specialist. And so students will be interacting with those folks and we'll talk maybe a little bit more about them uh, during the resources time, but you'll hear from them and about them uh, throughout high school as well. And then finally, the office and support staff. So so that could be anything from like Omar, our attendance secretary, um, Zan, our nurse, Blanca, our registrar, Jordi, our career tech. Our, we have a few campus monitors, uh, instructional assistants, paraprofessionals. All of these types of folks are here to help coach and provide guidance and support um, and sometimes correction uh, to students as they go through high school. Um, just like an athlete, sometimes we do things wrong or we don't quite approach something the right way. And sometimes we need some correction or redirection. Uh, but it, at North Tall High School, we try to take it from a really restorative and, and supportive approach that helps us be uh, mindful of the impact on students and, and that we're not saying they're bad people. If we have to correct them, we're saying like, we just need to change what we're doing and, 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 you know, kind of observe the norms of the school and the rules and things like that. So, um, but those are some of the coaches that you'll see throughout the year. I just want to kind of just call them out because, um, we really are this team, 
and the students are the players. We, the adults, are typically part of that coaching staff, and we all take different roles, but it's really important to know um, who some of these faces and positions are. So specifically for school counseling, there are three academic, three domains, realistically, that, that we kind of use um, as a profession to guide our work. Um, and we work a lot as generalists, meaning we have a lot of information about a lot of different things. Um, and, you know, we, we specialize in some areas too, and we dive deep, but uh, we're kind of like in the, the medical profession, we would be your, your general practitioner, your family doctor, um, sometimes an emergency room vet, you know, attack or something like that as well. But uh, we're not the specialist. We're not the neurologist. We're not the, you know, the, you know, the, the oncologist and things like that. Very, very detailed and very, very focused on particular areas. Uh, we do quite a bit and quite a bit of everything. Okay. But our three primary domains that we work in um, is the academic domain. So that's going to be studying homework, taking tests, creating academic and course plans. So, so pretty much anything having to do with learning and success around learning, working on struggles, things like that. The second area is what we call social emotional. All right. And that's going to be um, kind of the, the touchy feely element of counseling. And so that's going to be the, the highs. You know, so celebrating and, and working through all the celebrations, but also kind of, you know, the struggles and sometimes things come up that are, are difficult to manage and understand as a growing teenager. Uh, and, and sometimes there's disappointment and sometimes there's fear or regret. Uh, and so the social emotional de domain really helps develop the, the interpersonal and intrapersonal relationships that students have, uh, both with themselves and other people. And then lastly, the college and career areas. And so that's going to be helping prepare students for what comes next or what comes in the next sequence of events towards their, you know, their, their kind of adult life. And so that could be anything from helping students um, understand maybe what college classes might be beneficial to them to take at Sierra College or helping to prepare students uh, getting ready for an AP exam. Uh, it could be helping students take and understand a personality assessment to help them with some career planning elements, applying to college, all those types of things. Um, I will tell you right now in these three domains, uh, the, the first two are the main ones that we kind of dive into and really drill into in ninth grade for sure. And even as we transition into 10th grade, the third one, college and career starts to really start showing up partway through 10th grade and definitely going into 11th and 12th grade. And it's not that we're not doing things for college and career in 9th and 10th grade, um, but it's we're doing things differently and we're really working on the foundational elements of college and career versus actually like making college lists and things like that, which sometimes people are wondering, well, what are we doing for college? We're doing them all, you know, we're setting up the academic success piece um, and then that's going to help build the college and career components. You as families and parents and guardians, uh, you are really both. You're a coach and you're a cheerleader. Okay. And so the, the, they, they're kind of one and the same, but different. Uh, so the coach comes in of like, yes, we're going to set up the stage. We are going to, just like we do, um, give them some strategies to help them improve and grow, but also correct and redirect um, where needed as well. Um, you're also the cheerleader. And sometimes that means uh, that you have unconditional positive regard is what we would call it in counseling. And that, you know what, they're your kid and they are going to screw up, but you're going to be their biggest cheerleader. You might have to hold them accountable too, but you're not going to ever stop kind of like rooting them on and getting them across that finish line to their goal. Um, the one thing that you don't see on these two things is you're not the player. Okay. And so this is a very big shift for some families uh, and some students and parents as well. Um, and that, before high school started, sometimes there, as students are growing up, there's more of an involvement of the parent in the every day-to-day -day stuff that goes on in the classroom. Maybe it's helping kids regularly with homework and like really kind of doing a partner approach to like projects and things like that. You definitely can still be involved in there. You can help uh, scaffold skills and make connections. But if you're kind of jumping in and playing the game for the student, it's not benefiting you and it's not benefiting the student, that's for sure. Okay. So that's one thing you'll hear from me. I'm a big proponent of helping students or not, not earn, but really develop the sense of um, accomplishment on their own and, and their confidence that they have to step into the world of high school. Okay. So, so just think about that. You know, sometimes it's a nice thing to reflect on and say, you know what, am I acting like the coach or am I acting like the player when you're having some struggles, maybe with a kid or your student or things like that, because it, it does make a difference. And, and students know that they pick up on it and either they, 
they like let you do it because it's easy for them, right? If, if mom or dad or whoever wants to do my, you know, my project, then I'll let them, uh, or my college application, I'll let them. Uh, but sometimes it also kind of undermines a lot of their effort and they, they actually lose motivation related to that. So just keep, keep that kind of like dichotomy of a cheerleader and a coach in your mind. And that's really the lens that I want to encourage parents and families to come through uh, as we work through high school. Okay, so that, that just reiterates that none of us are actually getting in the game, myself included, teachers included. We have to step back and let the students actually play. Okay, and, and sometimes that means losing. Sometimes that means struggling. Sometimes it means getting hurt and, and having hard things. But um, more often than not, it means feeling successful, learning and growing and being, you know, and winning uh, the game. So the second thing that I want to kind of dive into is some nuts and bolts about kind of how to make this year successful, understanding some of the systems and processes related to high school. Um, there are a number of systems and processes which will be new to you. Um, I'm sure you've probably already experienced some of them. However, um, I'm gonna focus mainly on the ones that are coming from my office. I might touch on a couple other elements though too, but you might wanna like also dive into things like attendance or grading or stuff like that. So those are also gonna be things that have resources online. There's people we can connect you with if you have questions about our grading policies or attendance or whatnot, okay? Uh, but a couple tips. So the first tip that I have for you is we, and I, when I say we, I'm talking about myself and, and Ms. Jango Cohen, primarily our counselors. Um, we run our, our meetings by preferably appointment. Okay, so we have a lot of different things. Like I said, we're generalists. We might be here, there, the other place. We might be in a classroom. We might be talking to a student, sitting down in an emergency support meeting. There's a lot of things that come up. And so we do ask when at all possible that, that students and parents create appointments with us um, when you have something, maybe a question or something that you'd like to discuss. And it does a couple things. Number one is it helps you and ins be ensured like our focus is going to be on you. Okay. And so we don't want to be distracted by 10 different things that are happening when we're supposed to be kind of really focused on what your question is and your needs are. Uh, it's really important for us to, to, to sit down with you and answer those things. Um, that just helps us make sure that we're chiseling away time to do that. Um, there are some things that do come up. Sometimes we have to cancel appointments last minute or rearrange stuff if we get sick or um, I mentioned I have three kids, so they get sick, obviously. Um, and sometimes we do have last minute kind of emergency stuff that that can't be really planned around. And so sometimes, uh, I would say rarely, but there might be times when we have to cancel an appointment five minutes before we're supposed to be sitting down. And, and, and we're very, very, we will apologize if that ever happens in the fan, in advance, but um, I promise you it'll be for a good reason. It's not for anything that, you know, we're not running down the 7-Eleven and getting a Slurpee. Okay. The second thing is email. Um, personally, I am a big emailer. I like email. It's functional. It's efficient for me. Um, and I can answer it on my phone. I can answer it on my device, wherever I might be. Um, the other thing is, it, is it allows me to kind of like respond in a way that might be efficient for your time as well. Meaning we don't have to be in the same place. Not every conversation is appropriate for email, but many times it's a good starting place. Um, and so it also is my reminder system. So that's kind of like my, my little to-do list. And so sometimes I'll tell parent or students, hey, can if I'm talking to a kid in the hall, I might say, hey, can you send me a quick note on an email just so I remember to do that when I get back in my office in front of my computer. But feel free to please send emails to me. Um, I do have a phone. I do have a voicemail. Uh, I will just fair warning. Sometimes it's two or three days before I'm able to check my voicemail and get back to you. So if there's ever an emergency, if there's ever anything time sensitive, please don't leave a voicemail necessarily. You can try that, but I would also follow it up with an email uh, because I'm probably more likely to see the email than get a voicemail in a, in a quick turnaround time. Um, and then again, my caseloads, once again, will be the even year graduating classes, not the even grades. Right. So I'll make it the, the denotion. So it's not 10th and 12th this year, right? Those are the even grades of high school. My caseload is the even graduating classes. So this year, that's the class of 2026 and the class of 2028. That just so happens to be this year's 9th and 11th graders. Okay. And so that will continue over the, the course of the, the upcoming school years. Um, a couple more tips just to be aware of. Um, I encourage families to get involved, even in high school. Statistically speaking, parent involvement is at its lowest during our high school years, meaning like we don't have that many parent volunteers. We don't have people like volunteering in classes and partly rightfully so, like students are coming of age. They're growing up, usually get to the point where they're kind of embarrassed to have their mom or dad or whoever around. Um, but I, I do want to encourage you. It helps you stay connected with school and what's going on. It also helps us to get to know you. 
um, as a family and as a parent more um, outside of just being a parent. Uh, so there are a number of ways I would encourage you to reach out um, wherever you have time or are available to do so. So that might be something like boosters and it might not be like a leadership role. I might just saying like, hey, I'm available to come help out once a month at a game if you need some help. It might be engaging with the PTO in some way. It might be volunteering in a class. Believe it or not, we do allow you know parents and folks to come in and volunteer and help in a class. And sometimes people will want that. So very least, I would encourage you to make sure that you're attending any meetings. It might be back to school night. It might be viewing a meeting like this. It might be uh, a student study team meeting or an IEP meeting or things like that. So make yourself available to some of those wherever you can. Um, and if you can't for some reason, please let us know uh, in advance if we can, and we can try to see if there's any alternatives we can maybe set up to, to help you access some of those resources. Many times for at least my meetings, I try to record them all so that I know that people can access them. This year, we're kind of shifting gears a little bit and making this more of like the video, and then we will have a follow-up session afterwards for in-person questions and stuff. But video tends, we, there's a lot of like horror stories, right? So from COVID, but it's something that I think makes our information and access much broader than having everyone expect to be there. This is the time and this is the only time, doesn't matter if you have, if you have a job or you have to make dinner or all that kind of stuff. Okay. So it's just important to note that that's something that's really important to, to do. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to mention, oops, I didn't cover the other pieces on the slide. So the second thing on here is ask questions. Okay. So most of the families of ninth graders, I would say a good percentage probably have never had a high school student. And so the expectation is low, <laughs> not saying that we don't have high expectations for families and students of performance and engagement and, you know, being ready for high school and, and working with us through high school to help you be the best you can be. But realistically, we don't expect you to know everything about being a high school family. Okay. So, I always say there's no dumb questions. I say that with a caveat though. I would I would ask and implore that you, if you can please try to use your resources first though, if at all possible. So there's a lot of resources out there about the high school. Some of it can be overwhelming, I admit, uh, but where possible, see if you can do a little research or look up something on the website to start. It just is, it's helpful for, for everyone's time to kind of maybe there's something out there that answers that question right away. So if you can do a quick Google search or hop on our website and do a quick search on there, that's a really nice way to potentially get your question answered even quicker because it might be right there at your fingertips. Um, but again, there's no dumb questions. Um, that being said, uh, and you asking questions will never, ever be a waste of our time. Okay. So if you have a question, we want to be here to help you with it. Uh, uh, it's not always something that if you walk in the office, we might not be there to answer the question at that very, very moment, but it's something that if you uh, have a question, we will not, not answer that question at some point in some way. Um, so please feel free to ask. And then lastly, enjoy them. Okay. And, and what that means is realistically your student is in the last four years of their formal education system. And typically when that's over most, if not all students tend to move away from home. Okay. And so, I know that's a really scary thing for some families, but it's something that's uh, exciting as well. Uh, and maybe maybe you're excited because you can't wait to redo their room or something like that. But enjoy the time that you have left with your high school student. Um, that means like engaging in conversations with them. And that might take practice as a parent. I'm happy to game plan with you. If you're like, I don't know how to talk to my kid. Um, that's a great thing that we can support you with. Um, plan some regular activities. Uh, one thing that I strongly suggest, and, and you can call it what it is, um, I call it like plan a date, go on a date once a month with your senior or your freshman or whatever grade level they're in and be able to, to sit down and just like do something fun, but like add, you know, you as a parent can add a couple little things like, Hey, so, you know, this month, like, what are you looking forward to about school? What are some things that you really like learned about yourself over the last couple months starting high school? Um, what are some of your favorite classes? What's what classes can't you stand and why? Okay. So like starting to like, and, and don't make that it's, it should not be an interrogation date. Don't make it that. Okay. So just spend time together. Uh, if we had a few folks that showed up to at link crew, we had a, a session and we did this activity with students. I'm just going to briefly touch on it. Cause I think it's important. It's, it's a cool thing um, that we're trying this year that I think will be powerful as students move towards graduation. Um, 
I will share a link to a PDF of this. If you want to do this and you weren't at that event, um, you can feel free to do that. You All you need to do is, is I asked families to write a letter to their future graduate. Okay, And so there was a template that I gave them. It looks like this. You can access it on PDF if you want. If you don't have it, it's literally just a letter. You can just write it. Um, and then stick it in an envelope and bring it back to me here at school. Um, hopefully the next couple months. Like Try not to wait too, too long. Um, but I have a folder in my office uh, right, in, right over here that... Um, I stuck these letters in and the plan is I put a reminder on my calendar four years from now. So the, a couple of days before graduation, the plan is to give those letters to your future graduates. Okay. So think about all the different things that you might want to tell them. Um, and, and I think it'll just be really meaningful to students who are getting these when they're getting ready to graduate, um, that their parent or guardian or someone that they love wrote to them, uh, you know, four years ago when they were just starting out on this journey of high school. So I feel like that's a really cool opportunity. Another nuts and boltsy thing, uh, if you're watching this before kind of the end of September, uh, there's likely still seats that you can check out. We have a cool event that's coming up. It's called the College Admissions Case Study. This is a biannual, like biannual meaning every two years, not every, not twice every year, um, a biannual event. So there's a good chance this might not come up again until your freshmen are probably going to be juniors. Um, so don't this don't don't look for this next year, most likely. Uh, but this is an event where you can take the driver's seat in the college admissions process and understand what it actually looks like and feels like to review fake applications for a fake college with some leading college admissions reps. I'm not going to dive too much in there. If you want to learn more about it, there's a QR code and you can find information on our website um, and in several emails that have gone out about this. Uh, but registration is required and it's open for any ninth through 12th grader and their parent or guardian. Okay, so there are some steps to take to get registered for that. I do want to say there is limited seating though, so make sure that if you're going to do that, do that soon. A couple other key dates. I mentioned the October 5th is that college admissions case study. It is a Saturday and it's here at North Tower High School. A um, couple other key dates that you just want to be aware of. Um, the next big one uh, is going to be a final grading period on January 24th is the end of the first semester. And what that means is any grade at that point becomes final. And that's what's determining college admissions, grades towards graduation, credits, all that fun stuff. We have several uh, progress reports that happen throughout the year, and that's something that you'll get. But those don't impact anything other than potentially athletics, as if you're playing athletics during that time frame. But it doesn't go onto your transcript, and it's really just a snapshot. That final grade on January 24th will be like a forever grade that lives in your transcript. Um, another thing that's going to be coming up in February is when we start planning around making some course requests and thinking about what we're going to be doing in our 10th grade school year. And we'll have some information about that coming out towards uh, the later December timeframe. And then finally, uh, end of semester two, we'll be out on or around. There's an asterisk because there's no days and all that stuff. Uh, June, uh, June uh, sorry, June, June 18th, not 28th. Um, that's, the, that's the other final grading period. So those are the two marking periods that you'll have. And those are the ones determining credits, grades, GPA, all that fun stuff. So those are some, you know, four kind of big events that are going to be happening so far in this year. There's many others out there, but these are some key ones I just want to put out there so you know kind of what's coming up over the course of the year. The other thing that you have to do is get some community service hours. I indicated on here, these are annual hours. There's two elements of community service. Okay, and this runs through your students' pathways class. Two elements of community service. One of them is they need an annual uh, amount of hours to be turned in and that's to pass their pathways classes. Okay, so in ninth grade, every ninth grader needs to accumulate six hours during that ninth grade year. Okay, and they'll, many, of, many of the grade levels will actually break that in half by semester, so three and three, for example. And that grade is oftentimes uh, tied to passing that pathways class. Okay, um, and then eight, eight, eight following. And so what that means is every student, by the time they get to graduation, which is the second requirement, so you have the annual amount, then you have a total cumulative amount. And that's 30 hours total by graduation, all right? Some students may get 30 hours done in their freshman year, which is awesome, pat them on the back, put it on their resume, things like that. It's good experience, it's good things to do, okay? They will meet this requirement potentially as a ninth grader they will still need to do their hourly requirements in order to pass pathways, even if they complete the total 30 hour requirements say in one given year. Okay, so there are two requirements. I just wanna make sure you know that. And there are some forms and processes and procedures to do that in, in your pathways classes and some information on our website will help uh, go into that a little bit more. So I know I've been a little, little long-winded, which you'll learn, I, I, I talk a little bit. Um, 
So I'm gonna try to speed through a couple things here um, to make best use of our time. I expect this video to probably be a little bit longer than typical um, that we are hoping to do over the course of this year and send out, sending out more short snippets of things versus like a long winded thing like this kind of what probably will end up being. Um, I'm aiming for about 40 minutes maybe 45 minutes for this video here um, that you can maybe break up into sections. But I do want to spend a few minutes here with you talking about neurobiology. And, and neurobiology is just understanding what the brain is doing. Um, and it's a fascinating th thing to, to understand uh, because it's so active when your students are this age and as they progress up until about 24, 25 years old. Um, and so this idea of neurobiology um, really kind of like sets a little bit of context to what students are kind of experiencing and, and probably what you're seeing at home. I know for sure it's what I'm seeing here at school many times, but usually when I explain stuff like this to families and parents, you're maybe a little less familiar with it. They're like, oh, so that's why my kid can't wake up or things like that. Okay. So just briefly, I'm going to kind of go over a little bit of the brain. Okay. And there's several different lobes and that's the sections of the brain. And the lobes are typically responsible for taking care of certain elements of our character, of our kind of functionality, of our thought process, our memory, you know, automatic automatic sense of like breathing and like balance and things like that. Okay. So I'm going to go through a couple of those. I'm going to highlight a couple of things for you. Okay. So the first one is the parietal lobe. That's kind of towards the back here. Um, and that is really our sensitive brain. Okay. So that's really, it's, it's, it's in charge of all the sensory elements. So touch, temperature, understanding where you are in space. Um, it also is really important for language processing. Okay, so this is really gonna be something that um, if someone has is having like a language development or acquisition issue, sometimes there's something going on with the parietal lobe. Or if you get injured or have a, a bad concussion, sometimes it can potentially cause issues with say language or understanding as well as things like speaking and, and, and kind of processing the details of, of, of speech basically. Um, another thing that's a fun fact about the parietal lobe is it's actually responsible for brain freeze. Okay. That's the cold sensation when you chug a smoothie or something like that. Um, it's your brain trying to process this cold feeling um, and the cold sensation that comes from like really kind of overdoing it with the cold. Um, and it sends this pain signal that says, Hey, this might not be okay. All right. So that's the brain freeze. And that's part of the reason why that your parietal lobe is involved in that. It's also our calculator. Okay. And in many places where also our math understanding lives. Okay. So being able to do calculations and understanding logic and things like that tends to fall much in the parietal lobe here. Um, the next one is the cerebellum and brainstem. That's the very bottom part um, of our brain. And this is what many people would call the reptilian brain. It maintains the automatic function. So breathing, sleeping, swallowing, um, sweating, some of those different things that our body just naturally does that you relatively don't have to focus too much on. Um, and its primary focus, and the reason why they call it a reptilian brain, because it's like the very basic root of the brain without much higher order thinking, is the focus on survival. Okay, so it just, it kind of does its thing, and many times it's not so much involved in much other things. Um, it's also the autopilot. So if you've ever been driving home and, and been thinking or distracted or something like that, and then all of a sudden you're home and you didn't realize, you can't really remember even like driving. I know I've done that before. It's like, oh, where did the last 20 minutes go? Usually it's this part of the brain that has taken over and kind of just does these routines automatically. Um, or it's also how you kind of like just hop on a bike. Once you learn how to ride a bike, it becomes this automatic sequence. And, and usually you don't forget how to ride a bike. Um, it's also fight or flight. Okay. So and sometimes this over can be overactive in students and, and people. Okay. So it, it, it can trigger things like um, anxiety responses and stuff like that. So that's some of where we see uh, responses in that way, along with other areas of the brain as well. Um, next, the occipital lobe is a, um, a big part of our visual processing. Okay, so recognizing faces, understanding colors, interpreting information visually is where this part of the brain really gets in it. And it's very far in the back here. Um, there's, there's many times when sometimes people like get in a car accident, maybe they hit their head. Sometimes it can mess with their visual processing for a short period of time while that's recovering. Um, and sometimes there's, there's some diseases that can ruin, um, parts of your occipital lobe, which, uh, maybe impacts your eyesight. Um, it's also, um, like our motion detector and kind of like a mental movie theater as well. So it keeps our visual fields aware of like what's going on. So like when you have this peripheral vision stuff and it's like, you notice something, it kind of start, it startles you. 
that's usually your occipital lobe, keeping an eye out for your safety. Um, and it helps us understand kind of the world around us. It also helps us kind of revisit if you ever like shut your eyes and can visually see things, even though your eyes are shut. This is part of our brain that's pulling up memories and, and trans essentially translating, interpreting what they mean. Um, and we can actually revisit them kind of visually without actually seeing. Um, the next one is the temporal lobe. Okay, the temporal lobe is believed to be um, kind of our emotional center of the brain. Uh, it, under, it helps with like language comprehension. Um, so, so remember the the, uh, the parietal lobe does the the think like the hearing, understanding sound and things like that. The emotional brain, this language comprehension, assigns like emotion to it and, and inflection and, and understands the, the the deeper meaning of what you're hearing and helps process that. It also is very involved with the mem memory formation and has houses a lot of the core aspects of some of the emotional and behavioral elements of who we are. So amygdala, the, 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 the thalamus and things like that all live within this area. And it's something that um, produces a lot of uh, hormones and, and neurotransmitters that affect emotion and stuff like that. So it's pretty important. Um, and it's also one of the main reasons I looked up a couple like key, like fun facts about each, each lobe. And it's one of the main reasons we ex actually experienced deja vu. Um, so it, it, it kind of, makes you wonder, well, oh, I thought, I, I think I remember that. It's also the area that if, like, if you, if, if you smell something and it brings you back to an experience, it connects that, that kind of sensory experience with a memory. And a lot of times it's an emotional connection. It could be a good emotion or a bad emotion, but there a lot of times there's an emotional connection, which is why that part of the brain functions that way. And then finally, and honestly, most importantly, um, uh, for this age range is the frontal lobe. Okay. The frontal lobe is mission control. Okay, so it is controlling all of the higher level thinking, the problem solving, decision making, planning, organization, impulse control. Um, it also partners with that temporal lobe to, to kind of like understand and, and process emotions. Um, this is also where you can understand jokes and sarcasm. So, so you know, I think what you'll probably notice um, is which part of the brain isn't fully developed in teenagers, if you had to guess. Yes, this one here. <laughs> okay, so this one is actually not developed in, in pe the research is saying between about 24, 25 years old or so. Okay, so it's continually developed every year. It gets a little bit more developed, connect more connections are made. But this is the one that helps you think about the consequences of decisions that you make. Okay, so when students in ninth grade, 10th grade, 12th grade are making poor decisions, part of it is on them. But part of it for us to understand and why we can understand that is because ours is fully developed. We can think three steps ahead. Physiologically, they literally can't sometimes. And it's something important for us to understand, both with how we're addressing that concern, but also as we're processing that concern when things happen. Okay, That, you know what, they maybe didn't think three steps down the road, and many times it's not even their fault. Okay. Um, this is also where kind of like our consciousness lives, uh, like the decisions between good and bad, right and wrong. Is this moral or not? Okay, this also lives in this area. Um, and I think understanding more about this area in particular for your ninth grade student will be super crucial. Okay, because, you know, at, you've probably seen it as they've grown up. There's, they've probably had several like growth spurts, both physically and kind of mentally and emotionally. Okay, this is going to be something that you'll notice develop over this course of high school, and it may not get to where you kind of hope or want it to be by the time they graduate. Um, you may see the effects and ramifications of an underdeveloped um, frontal lobe, but it's something that you'll notice also changes in a good way too. Many times what we see year after year is it seems like the year after between, like the summer between sophomore and junior year seems to, especially among young men, but across the board seems to have this like explosion of like, oh, I get it. Now I can see why I'm doing high school. The problem is many times their bad decisions have gotten to, you know, to a place where maybe they have uh, worked themselves out of certain opportunities after high school or something like that. But we try to avoid many of those things, but it's just important to understand some of this neurobiology so that you know the root of what some of the, the, the behaviors and needs that your students and the students around them may need. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about academics. Um, so the academic T's, I, I kind of try to figure out a way to make it all flow together. So I came up with T's. The last one's a little bit weird, but um, I had to make it a T. So time is the first one. 
Okay, so high school provides a nice, fresh academic slate. Their eighth grade, seventh grade, middle school, any grades, any kind of academic experiences, um, with one exception, don't follow them to high school. The only exception to that would be placement in classes, right? So if they, uh, for example, in math, weren't in math one and, and maybe they're doing math one as a, as a, as a ninth grader um, instead of maybe going into math two, that's the only impact potentially that a ninth uh, a, a prior academic experience might directly bring with them to high school. They don't have grades. Their GPA is zero. Um, so it's all something that to be aware of that they get that fresh start. Um, the biggest thing also is, is for time is the, that using that time wisely while they're at school, especially um, most classes, especially in ninth grade, will tell you that it, you only have homework if really you don't finish what you do in class, which most classes are designed to, to get most of that work done during class time. So if they come home with lots of homework, it usually means that maybe they weren't using their class time super, super well. Um, it might be worth a conversation around that. Um, but it's something that I do also ask that, that students start getting into a habit of spending about 30 minutes a, a night or an evening or after school um, every day of the week doing something academically related. And that might not be doing homework. It might be prepping for an upcoming as exam. It might be doing some research on something that they're interested in. Maybe they're like super stoked on black holes. Have them pull up YouTube. YouTube is a great resource. Have them watch educationally related videos on black holes if that's what they're into. Have them research some future careers. Um, have them write poetry. There's a lot of things that are academic. Have them read a book okay, that they can do for 30 minutes every day outside of school, even if they come home and say, I don't have any homework. So this is your excuse as a family to always say, you have 30 minutes of homework no matter what. Okay, They might use that for biology. They might use that for English. But if they come home and they say, I have nothing to do, tell them you can do something else for 30 minutes. Pick something that's useful for you. If you need some more ideas, you can ask me as well. Talking is the second T. Communication is super important in school. Um, that, that includes like things like asking for help, understanding and getting feedback. Um, and part of that is also kind of like talking and building relationships. So that talking component is really important for both of those things, clarity and understanding, but also developing that back and forth with relationships. And the last T is tweaking. Okay, so yeah, I told you the last T was a little bit weird, but tweaking, okay. And mainly that's to look at, okay, so what has worked historically for students sometimes may not work as well or at all in high school. Okay. My own personal example was I was a great high school student um, academically, uh, and I was a terrible college student when I got there. And the main reason was I did not have to practice or learn how to really study all that much in high school. And when I started, you know, engineering program in college, it sucked. It kicked my butt. And, um, that piece is is a, is a testament that sometimes, you know, we have to ditch a plan and try something new. And sometimes we need to help figuring out what that looks like. OK, um, because things will continue to get more difficult as school goes on. They're supposed to. Um, so so kind of like starting these habits strongly now and then being willing to kind of go back to the drawing board is helpful. This on the screen that you see now is kind of. We have this document in the office, but this is an outline of our high school graduation requirements in kind of like a pictorial format. Okay, each little big box that says English and math and so on um, has information about how many years or credits students need to achieve to get, you know, that that diploma when they graduate. I'm not diving into the specifics today. Please do note that all ninth graders start their path to graduation this year and that we ensure that every student is taking the appropriate classes to make that progress to get there. Okay, so there's nothing that you need to do this year to like, are we not doing something that we should be? No, you're doing the things that you should be this year. The main thing about this is that we do have students check and I check every year, usually several times throughout the year to make sure students are progressing towards their goals of graduation. A big thing that you need to know about this though is grades. So, so grades do matter, okay? So we have A, B, C, D, and F. Students must achieve a D minus or better um, to graduate. I'm sorry, I made a slight typo here. Uh, for graduation, which should be what it says instead of for A through G. Um, so it must get a D minus or better to graduate. Okay, and there's some slight differences as we talk about this idea of A through G. Um, but D minus or better means they pass, they will earn credits towards graduation. I always say Ds get degrees, okay, for high school. Um, this slide has information about the A through G requirements. A through G requirements are the minimum expectations that um, colleges and universities have related to um, a, submitting a, a freshman, first time freshman application once students get there during their senior year. 
I do want to highlight the underlined word here. It says minimum. Okay. By doing the, the, the column on the left that starts with like A, history, social science, two years. That two years is the minimum requirement, meaning you have to do that to be able to submit an application. That's your, I have the privilege of now applying. Okay. The reality is, is students who want to be competitive, which is a difference between those two things, really will likely do additional work beyond the minimum requirements. The best news that I will share with you though about this is again, similar to your graduation requirements, you are doing all the right things this year that you also need to do um, towards meeting these requirements as well. Uh, and some of the more intricate components really start to build in the junior and senior year when you completed maybe some of these areas and should I take another math class or should I take an additional science class or so on. The biggest thing related to this is the change in grade requirement that you must get to be qualified for A through G. And this, this slide is correct in that the C minus or better is a big benchmark that if you get a D in English, until we fix that D, you are not on track to meet a four-year college minimum expectation for applying. Okay, that's a big change. And so we really want to hammer down this idea of we really want to see students getting at least a C minus or better. It keeps all the opportunities open. If you do end up with a D or an F in a class, we have ways to work on remediating it, remediating it, but it, it it's just better to aim for that if we can from the get-go. Right now, this ninth grade year is really a strong foundational component. That's our goal this year. We want to set a strong foundation related to completing high school, preparing for next steps in life, and moving forward. Okay, so there's four elements that I put up here that are related to a strong foundation. I wrote healthy rigor. Rigor means the difficulty and challenge of classes, but many times we just talk about rigor, okay? But I think healthy is a really important qualifier to that because you can do all the things that are rigorous, but realistically doing that and maintaining health and wellness and things like that usually are against each other to some degree you will get to a point in rigor that you no longer can find appropriate time to sleep, take care of yourself, eat healthily, get out and exercise, do things that you enjoy as a person too. And those are equally um, valuable for students to understand. The second one is developing relationships. That goes back to that idea of talking, starting to make connections with teachers, with staff, with myself, other and new students. Um, those relationships are super crucial for um, being able to, 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 you know, navigate high school successfully, but also you're going to want some of those folks to help you out in the future and having a relationship will help along the way. Getting involved is another one that's super crucial. So that's going to be joining a club, playing a sport, even if you're not really athletic. Um, many of our sports are non-competitive, meaning that you don't have to like get cut. If you want to try something, I encourage you to go for it. That also helps with developing relationships. If you're shy, if your student is a little quiet, encourage them to try something. Um, you have a natural friend group or a natural kind of camaraderie with a team around you. And then lastly is building skills. And building is the key word there is that we don't necessarily expect that every student has the skills already, but we will ask students to practice those. Sometimes they struggle through those, that they have to kind of develop those skills. And sometimes it's hard. Usually, you know, if we're working out and we're, you know, we're pumping iron, we're ripping muscles apart to rebuild them. And that's sometimes what we have to do to rebuild academic skills and understanding and knowledge and, and kind of that tenacity towards learning. So those are four elements of a really strong foundation that I'm hoping over the course of this year that your students will be able to, to dive into and build more of. So almost lastly, I'm going to talk briefly about our support systems that we have here, and then we'll be wrapping up for this video. Um, but we do have a number of different support systems throughout the school and different avenues, whether that's academic or social, emotional and mental health um, or college and career. There's a number of different ways that we can tap into tools, um, different layers of support. And I'm going to highlight just four or five of them here for you. OK, so we use a system that's called MTSS multi multi sorry, multi tiered systems of support. Um, and those are going to be elements that basically about 80% of the students in this MTSS model can basically be supported in what we call tier one. This is going to be our typical interventions that we have in classrooms, in normal counseling sessions, in our pathways classes, um, maybe through an RTI or something similar where it's, this is a, essentially a generalized support system that we offer to any and all students that might want some additional help. The next level in this, this MTSS is usually diagrammed as a 
like a pyramid or a triangle. The next level of the MTSS is really kind of diving into this idea of about 15 or so percent of students need some additional support beyond just that um, kind of like stuff that's available to everyone. That might be um, some regular counseling sessions. It could be um, working with our wellness center a little bit more. It might be uh, having a parent teacher conference or an SST meeting, for example. And then the last avenue, and that's about, like I said, 15% is that middle boot group and about 5% or so need some really intensive supports. And that could be, again, for myriad of, myriad of things. It might be intensive language support. It might be intensive learning support. It might be intensive mental health support. And those are things that we have referral systems in place. Um, and we usually work through those tiers um, together as a, as a team here at school. So a couple things just to note that I wanted to call out. So we do have RTI. RTI stands for response to intervention. That's a fancy way to say it's help. <laughs> okay. So, um, it's a, it's a help period that we have twice a week in the mornings on our block days. Um, so school, I always say school starts at 730 every day. Okay. If students start getting to a place where they're caught up and you're happy with their grades, they don't need help with things. Then that's a family decision, whether or not they decide to, to come or not. Um, Teachers can require students to attend RTI, uh, but it's not a scheduled period of their day. Okay, so if they are missing a test or if they are needing a reteaching, a teacher might say, you need to come to my RTI next week and they're, re they're expected to be there. Okay, but it is available. It happens two hours every single week, um, which accounts for a lot of time. And so I want, you, I want to encourage you, especially as ninth grade families, to take advantage of it. The second one you see on there is S SST meetings, student study team or student success team meetings. And those are kind of in a tier, it kind of goes from tier one to tier two. And it's kind of like an avenue to maybe move into those more intensive support systems. But essentially it's a, it's a meeting that involves mostly the adults and the student and family to, to come together and talk about some of the things that are maybe of concern. But we also spend time celebrating that things are going well. Okay, so this is a meeting that, that puts all the collective brains together to figure out how we can best support students and what they need. Okay, as, as well as the family needs as well. Our wellness center is also here on campus. And so we have several great staff folks who work in there, Hillary and Jamie primarily, um, but they offer some social emotional support. They run a couple groups. Um, they're just a great trusted adult to talk to. Um, and it's a, it's a welcoming space that students have access to throughout the day to help support their, their mental health and well-being. Uh, we do have a mental health specialist. This is a tier two and tier three support, mainly in that kind of like more advanced range of mental health need. Um, and that's stu students who go and see, that's Hillary Jimenez. She's our mental health uh, specialist. But those students are referred through our, we have a weekly circle of care meeting where we basically collaborate the support systems, uh, collaborate on the support systems and coordinate the support systems that students need access to throughout school. Um, so if you ever want, have questions about some of that, if that's something that might be useful or maybe a referral to an outside uh, mental health therapist, we can connect with that too, which goes into my last point of community connections. We do partner with a number of agencies, Sierra Community House, the hospital districts, Gateway, different therapists, different support systems, Boys and Girls Club, ARC, a lot of different things in the area that help both students, adults, and family systems function as best they can. Um, here in our community of, of learners and community as a, as a greater Tahoe area. Okay, so those are just a few examples of some, some support systems. And again, going back to a previous slide where it says questions, if you have questions about how to access some of these or what some of these even are, that's a great question to ask. Um, we can go through some of the details about those and make connections uh, with either myself who has answers or someone else who does if I don't. So next steps, uh, what do we do next from here? Um, that's the, the, the bulk of the, the content that I'm gonna share for us today. But I did want to invite you uh, to come in on Friday, October 27th. And hopefully you're watching this before then. If not, just see the bottom of this <laughs> little blurb uh, for some alternatives. But I wanted to, you know, like I said, flip this process, get you some information in advance, and then take our time together potentially to sit down and answer some questions. Because uh, I know that, that that's what a big piece that we miss when we do like a virtual workshop is that in-person collaboration and connection and question time. So here's what I'm aiming for. Um, I'm going to plan on being uh, in room 158, which is Ms. Delorier's room down at the end of the hallway um, on Friday, October 27th from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. And I'm happy to have you drop in if you have questions, want to talk through any of this stuff, if you want more information on things. I will not be planning to present anything. It's more of like a conversation. I'm listening. I, I, I can answer questions that you might have. Um, please do check in in the office when you show up and then you'll get a, a little name badge and then you can walk down to that room and you'll get directed where that is. So please mark your calendars for that. Um, we'll send out some more details and information related to that 
with the email with this information. If you have, um, sometimes there's conflicts, I realize um, you may have work or child care responsibilities, things like that. If you do, um, you can also set up a, a, a appointment online if you'd like, uh, if you have some questions or start with an email. And maybe it's a basic question that I can answer pretty quickly or uh, send you a resource for. Um, Lastly, we will be sending out uh, essentially every other month or so, uh, sending out a newsletter, kind of an update from the counseling office with some upcoming details, events. I always try to include a couple of videos. Um, I mentioned that we will probably try to put out some, some snippets throughout the year. So that's one of our goals is taking some of these longer kind of things, whether that's a college success thing or financial aid thing down the, down the road when you get to, to older grades and breaking them into smaller more digestible chunks, both for us to prepare and deliver, but also for you to sit and listen to. I know that 50 minutes that we're at right now is a long time to sit and watch a video. So I apologize. These workshops usually are a little bit longer compared to some of the other things. But my goal for these other snippets would be about 15 minutes at the most, where you can get some information about a very particular subject that you're focused or interested in and just that. Okay, and then we can dive into any additional uh, supports that you may need from there. Okay, so if there's any additional questions that do come up, I hope that you join us on Friday, October 27th um, at school. And then if not, I, I'm happy to connect with you e over email, setting up an appointment. And I look forward to getting to know you as a family, you as an adult, and definitely getting to know your students as we work together. So thank you for watching and hanging in there. And I look forward to meeting with you again soon.